Herzlich willkommen zum 36. DocFest München zur zweiten At-Home-Edition hier aus dem prachtvollen Silbersaal im Deutschen Theater. Normalerweise wäre hier ein Kino, wir würden alle gemeinsam vor der großen Leinwand sitzen. Jetzt machen wir das etwas remote, aber mit umso mehr Leidenschaft und wir freuen uns hier auf eine weitere Edition dieses DocFestes. Mein Name ist Florian Schwarz, bin Moderator und Sprecher beim Bayerischen Rundfunk und führe durch dieses Gespräch. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our special event here with our strong partner since year, our partner History Channel. We have the special and we're going to screen and talk about the film 82 Names. Live with me in the studio is Emanuel Rothstein, program responsible from A&I Networks Germany. And we have a nice round here um, via our screens. First of all, I say hello to uh, Jumana Saif. She's a human rights attorney from the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, located in Berlin, actually. Hello, Jumana. Hi, hello. Hello. Then we're going to switch to our director, to the director of the film, is Mazia Bahari. He's the Iranian-Canadian journalist and filmmaker located actually in London. Hello, Mazia Bahari. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you very much. And we have Dr. Klaus Müller. He's the European representative of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, also sitting right now in Berlin, also a filmmaker. Hello to you, Klaus Müller. Nice to meet you, Florian. Thank you to your round, and we're going to start with Emmanuel. This film, 82 Names, Syria, please don't forget us. How did you get to know from this project? How did you get to know from this film? It was exactly one year ago. I was invited to the Munich uh, Jewish Muslim um, Society or, or, or Circle of Friends, and the film was presented there, and I was struck by it from the, meaning, uh, from the first minute, and... Um, It hasn't left me since, to be honest. Um, the premise of the film, um, Mansour's journey from Syria to Berlin, um, the connection between the memorial of the um, dead Syrian civilians to connect that to the um, murdered Jews was something I haven't seen before, I haven't heard before, and I had the wish to bring it to my audience at the History Channel and to present it also at the DocFest. It runs already on the History Channel? It will run soon from, from August onwards. We will have it on the channel. Excellent. Great. It's a very um, strong and emotional portrait of, um, this, uh, of our protagonist, Mansour Omari, and human rights activist, Mazia Bahari. Could you tell us uh, in the beginning of this talk, how did you get to know uh, him and his story, Uh, and then to make out of, the, out of this story the film 82 Names, Syria, Don't Forget Us. Sure. Uh, so I've been working with the Holocaust Museum in Washington for the past few years. And we were discussing different projects to talk about the Holocaust uh, to the Middle East audience and find out a way to discuss that issue, which is a taboo in the Middle East, in many countries, and it's uh, in, especially uh, in many Arab countries, and also in my country, Iran, we have the only leader who denies the Holocaust on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So we're discussing different projects, and uh, one day I remember I was at the museum, and Mansour came and... I didn't meet him then, but they told me that here is a Syrian former prisoner of conscience who has come to the museum and he's uh, giving the uh, five pieces of fabric with 82 names of his uh, former cellmates on them to the museum. So to me, it's really, really... Uh, I think it was just the moment that, you know, you realize that there is some story. And, you know, as filmmakers, we always look for the origins of the story and then you just follow it and see if it works in a film or not. And at that time, I remember that I thought this can be a good film, so I have to explore it a little bit more. 
because the fact that a Muslim Syrian coming to a museum that's dedicated to the memory of six million Jews who were perishing in the, during the Second World War was something strong to start with. So when I got in touch with Mansour and I realized that he was writing a book and he also had plans to create a similar memorial, then we discussed it with the museum and we thought that there is a very important story that needs to be told. So that was the beginning. But then when we went on the journey with Mansour and we started with the coast of Amalfi, which is always a nice place to start, uh, you know. Where Mansour anyway. lives? Yes. Uh, he was there for a moment. I think he, he's in uh, Sweden or London. I'm not sure where he is at the moment, but he was writing his uh, story at that time in the coast of Amalfi. And then we, when we, I discussed uh, Mansour's memories of uh, the prison and why he decided to write those names. It was just such an emotional story that uh, I thought it would be really, really uh, do well on film. Mm -hmm. and. Also, Mansour, uh, as an intellectual, as a journalist, as a human rights activist, he's a very good storyteller and he has a very expressive face. So he was an ideal uh, character uh, for the film. And I could see that uh, we could talk about the experiences of thousands of people like Mansour through his story. And I yes. think Jumana might be able to shed more light on that aspect of the story. But briefly, this is really what happened. Thank you very much. And there's, of course, a very strong contrast in the beginning, this uh, Amalfi Coast, and then to his horrible story that he uh, survived. And, uh, but the whole film is quite not theatralic, theatralic or theatralic, but you are very close to the protagonist and you could like really get this story, I think, very touching. Thank you for this first um, uh, impression, how you get to know Mansour Omari. Um, the question goes to Jomana Saif, human rights attorney. Um, you left Syria in 2012, one year after the beginning of the protests against Syria's president Bashar al-Assad. Um, how important is this film from Mazia Bahari for the fight against human rights violations? Actually, the film is very important. It reveals the systematic crimes of the Assad regime. It uh, educate uh, it educates uh, the people, the, the global public, about the crimes committed in Syria and the conflict in Syria. What is going on? So uh, I think also it uh, uh, preserves the, the history of the Syrian because also for for the new generation because to 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 know what is happening, what happened there. And uh, as uh, Mr. Bihari said, Mansour is one of uh, hundreds of thousands of people that they, they really they, they went uh, uh, through this uh, uh, very uh, uh, terrible or uh, uh, experience there. Just so that the film uh, brings the, the uh, attention to the, the, to, to the whole world. It's like uh, about the systematic and about the strategy of uh, be, disappearing people, torturing people, and even killing people in detention facilities of uh, the Assad regime. So this, this is why I think it's very important. It's... Uh, 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 hopefully that uh, uh, more people will be educated about the conflict in Syria, about the reality, about the truth, and also because the film also uh, uh, provides the narrative, our narrative, the Syrian narrative, who just went to the street just to, to, uh, to demand for freedom, from dig uh, dignity, mm -hmm. for a democratic country. It's not... not the narrative of the regime that's there, that we are a terrorist just fighting for, uh, for, uh, for nothing. So we, we are just asking uh, for, for our dignity and our basic rights. 
And it's so important that you just mentioned to really show these films in all kinds. I mean, you can, can show it to young uh, lawyers, of course. You can show it to a broader view through a channel uh, like Emmanuel does it with History Channel. Of course, on a festival like this, the Doc Fest, people get, should know these stories and it should be a ground for discussion. Uh, jumping to Dr. Klaus Müller in Berlin, the European representative of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, these close pieces that um, were like uh, smuggled out of the, the prison uh, in the film with the 82 names on it, um, how important is it to show them a broader public first, I think, in the, um, in the museum in, in, in New York and maybe also then in Berlin? I think they're very important because um, as, a, as a museum, we know if we, we need to tell the story through people or through artifacts. And I think what uh, Mansour Mari envisioned, um, as Masia Bahari already said, how important uh, these fabrics are not only for the parents of those people incarcerated in prisons so that they know their sons at least where they are, but I think Mansour also envisioned from the very beginning that these fabrics could tell the story of uh, the Syrian government's atrocities against its own people. And when he came um, to the Holocaust Museum, there was a, a sense of recognition for us because Holocaust remembrance culture is built on saying the names of the victims, of remembering those who, who were murdered during the Holocaust as, as sometimes the only gesture of, of remembrance that we still have, because often we only have the names. And so when Mansour came and told us that on these five fabrics are 82 names, uh, we immediately felt this connection and we started to work uh, with him. So we did an exhibition mm -hmm. uh, called um, 82 Names Syria, Please Don't Forget Us. That was for um, a year and a half shown at the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. And then we started to have this idea of the film. Um, and when we started to work with Mazia Bahari um, uh, on, on this film idea, um, again, Mansour surprised us because I said, he said, yes, I, I want to do this film. I'm also, mm -hmm. I do the interview in Amalfi. I come to Washington, but I want to go to Germany. I want to see how Germany coped with with its genocide, with its Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And that's why, that's where I met him when we, <clears throat> at the memorial to the murder Jews of Europe. Exactly, and there was this very strong scene where you are with him at the memorial in, um, in the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin and told him why it is so a long fight and even still such a hard fight to establish memorials. Why is this so in Germany? Um, I remember that, that scene, Florian. So we, we're standing there at the Memorial to the Murderers of Europe in the center of the city. And as memorials are, once they are erected, you have the feeling they're all, they are there for eternity. They, they always have been there. And, and Mansour <clears throat> came to Germany to understand how Germany dealt with its own genocide. And, and I was wondering if if that was not giving the wrong information because it was so much built in stone, but it wasn't there. When I was growing up in Germany, it wasn't there. It took mm -hmm. a long time. This memorial took 60 years from its um, yeah. so the memorial to the murder Jews of Europe, mm -hmm. uh, took 60 years. The idea was first expressed in 1988 and then uh, it was finally inaugurated in, in 2005. Yeah. And that's true for all memorials in Germany. They are built by few, in, they're initiated by individuals, small groups, local historians, local history groups, against state authorities, against their resistance, against the resistance or indifference by large parts of civil society. Mm -hmm. So it took a long time uh, for Germany to get there. And I wanted to encourage Mansour by saying, what you did is decisive. You, when, when we will look back in 20, 30 years, that exhibition, this film, your testimony exactly. will be seen as a building block of a <clears throat> Syrian remembrance culture. Mm -hmm. But that was tough for him because um, for him, he wants justice. He wants that to happen now. Yeah. He, and the idea that this could take six decades mm -hmm. before the Syrian people are told in truth. Therefore, that, that was 
Yeah, therefore, it's, it's just a little bit easier, of course, to organize exhibitions as you did as Emmanuel bringing out a film with History Channel. This is definitely uh, much shorter. And these uh, 82 names on these clothes pieces are really material witnesses and, and they overstay a long time. Um, jumping to uh, Mazia Bahari, the director of the film, um, yeah, 12 years ago oh. during the 2009 Iranian election protest, you self were arrested without charge and detained for more than 100 days in prison. How did you stay mentally strong during this time? Well, I think uh, I stayed somehow mentally uh, strong and managed to uh, continue to work by thinking that one day I will be out of prison mm -hmm. and I will be the voice of many of my friends who do not have a, a voice outside of prison. I can be presenting uh, different people within Iran and journalists all around the world and human rights activists all around the world who were not lucky as I was to work for an international uh, magazine like Newsweek at the time or work with different uh, broadcasting corporations all around the world. So that's what really made me uh, survive and hmm. thrive in a sense because I thought I have two choices. I can be traumatized and be quiet and I would just fade away, or I can just uh, use this opportunity to absorb and document what I was going through, tell that to the world and talk about it. And that's why maybe the story of Mansoor really resonated with me because uh, Mansoor uh, went through a similar uh, experience. Of course, he suffered much more uh, mm -hmm. physically, and the Syrian regime is much more physically brutal than the Iranian government, which is all about psychological torture rather than physical torture. Oh, but we both somehow thought that we, it is our responsibility to talk about what is going on. Mm -hmm. And it's not the survivor's guilt in a sense. Maybe there is a bit of a survivor's guilt involved in this. I'm not a therapist. I cannot talk about it. But I think uh, when you are going through such a horrible experience and when you're going through such a physical, uh, such physical humiliations and verbal humiliations, what you can do, especially if you're a journalist like me or Mansoor, you absorb it in your head and then you know that sometime you have to sublimate all this energy to something more positive. Mm -hmm. And I think making this film, doing other things that I've been doing since uh, 12 years ago, they're all part, part of the same process. Thank you for this personal insight and of course uh, as then professionally working as a journalist bringing this out as we all here are very interested in getting these stories. Uh, Jumana Saif, the human rights attorney, um, you founded the Syrian Woman Network and also you are a research fellow in the ECCHR program, the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights. What exactly are these two programs, the Syrian Woman Network and your program? for the European Center? Yeah, actually, uh, we founded the Syrian Women Network 2013, and then 2017 also, we, with many other women colleagues, we founded the uh, feminist movement, the first uh, Syrian feminist movement. We mainly uh, work on uh, uh, women empowerment, uh, empowerment, and we work on, on uh, women participation, active participation in general, but we all believe and work, uh, we believe that uh, uh, justice is a precondition for peace because we are struggling for peace, for achieving peace, but a sustainable peace. So for that, we believe that uh, accountability also and transitional justice, it's a very uh, important uh, uh, step to achieve justice. 
and uh, those who committed uh, international crimes, grave crimes, like and sexual and gender-based crimes, should be uh, held accountable. Those should be brought to 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 justice, and therefore we are working together. Uh, just with this is the fight for uh, justice, uh, supporting survivor, and also we believe that uh, the fight for justice uh, demands to to um, to understand the, the reasons behind the crimes and the power dynamics that led to to the commission of these crimes, and we believe that uh, also the the fight for justice demands to understand the the obstacles that prevent survivors to speak out uh, about what they they were subjected to. Mm -hmm. So this is the main issue that we are struggling. We are supporting uh, survivors that. Uh, um, to empower them to speak out because we believe that survivors should be at the front line for the fight of justice. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And for yes. yeah, and for sorry for uh, for uh, my work in that ECCHR, we are fighting impunity in a legal means, in various legal means, and we use uh, uh, uh we use this legal means for, uh, uh, the, the, in a way, to achieve justice, and because we also we believe that, and to highlight the uh, the legal uh, uh, injustice or mm -hmm. legal imbalances, and also the double standards in in our efforts for for justice, because we believe that uh, society uh, affected society can only heal when it's injustice or uh, is highlighted. So, yes. yeah, or recognized. Yeah, and this is our struggle for, for we are yeah, fighting and struggling for, for really for achieving justice uh, and also to hold these perpetrators uh, um, to be account, to be, yeah, uh, to be held to justice also. Thank you very much for your work and for uh, keeping this up all the time. It's so important. Uh, last round, because we are in the um, last phase of this uh, talk here about the film 82 Names. Together with me in the studio is Emmanuel Rothstein from History Channel. Um, last quick jump to Dr. Klaus Müller in Berlin. Um, you, as of course, also are an independent filmmaker. And in this film, 82 Names, you said Germany is a post-genocidal society. What did you meant with this? Thanks, Florian. I mean, Germany committed a genocide, and we do know from genocide uh, research that societies that, that cross that threshold are more in danger to fall back into this pattern. Um, the Holocaust is part of our history, it's part of our cultural DNA. And um, if you look at research, colleagues um, of mine at the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington um, uh, have published research that Germany and its allies ran 44,000 um, camps, ghettos, detention centers, uh, euthanasia killing facilities all across Europe. So the Holocaust mm. was everywhere. Yeah. And I think it's safer to understand what we are, a post-genocidal society, because traumatization, and, and Mrs. Seif already talked about that, it takes time to heal. It takes not just one or two generations to work through that. Um, so it's safer instead of congratulating ourselves to the considerable progress we made in, in looking at our history, but it's dangerous if you think, okay, we, we dealt with this, this uh, work is done, mm -hmm. um, it will pop up again. So this is a continuous effort that Germany is looking at. Thank you, and of course, this is uh, by festivals, by talking, by discussions, by journalism. It should be kept up, and if not, then we have the, the bitter part of that you forget something, and that should never happen. Thank you, Klaus. Last question to Mazia Bahari. Um, are you still in contact with Mazur Omari, and are, what are your next projects concerning also the conflict in Syria? Do you still work on some more stories? I'm in touch with Mansoor uh, on and off. Uh, he's a, he travels a lot, so I don't know, and he's studying, so he's a very busy man. 
And yes, we are in touch. And in terms of our projects, we have an ongoing project with the Holocaust Museum in Washington, which is called Sardari Project. Mm -hmm. And Sardari uh, was, Abdul Hussein Sardari was an Iranian diplomat during the Second World War in Paris, who saved the lives of uh, hundreds of Iranian and non-Iranian Jews in Paris by issuing them uh, Iranian passports and give them gave them uh, protection. So he's kind of an Iranian Raoul Wallenberg in a sense that he did that. So the project is called Sardari Project, and the purpose of the project is to teach Iranian public about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. We have had a series of articles and videos published on our website, which is called iranwired.com. Uh, and we, we will be doing much more this year as well. And what we want to do is really to talk about the lessons of the Holocaust for the future generation. And I think what really attracted me to Mansour's story and the movement, which uh, Jumana is part of it, and Mazen Darvish, who is in the film, is part of, and our friend uh, Anwar, is, uh, uh, who is also a lawyer in Berlin, is part of it, is the justice in the transitional justice part of it. Because when we talk about transitions, usually we forget the word uh, justice in it. And that somehow condemns many transitional governments or governments that rise from the uh, uh, ashes of an authoritarian state to repeat the same mistake. But by thinking about justice before the transition and by thinking about, talking about different uh, ways that we can uh, obtain justice, it is very important to have a, to build a better future mm -hmm. for Syria, for Iran, for other countries. Otherwise, we will see the same chaos that happened in Libya, in Iraq. When you know when the Saddam Hussein fell in yeah. uh, uh, Iraq in two thousand three. Yeah. Some people were delusional. They thought that, you know, the Americans would be uh, welcome, uh, you know, with red carpets mm -hmm. and there would be a democracy overnight. And then the democracy will uh, spread all over the Middle East. That's not true, right? Yeah. You have to talk about justice. You have to talk about ways to uh, achieve that justice beforehand. Mm -hmm. So in my own work that's uh, concentrated on Iran, we try to talk about how can we bring justice to the victims and to the survivors of injustices, but also to the perpetrators? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the perpetrators have to be uh, questioned and tried in a just manner, the same way as the victims. Otherwise, this vicious circle of violence, victimization, brutalization will continue and we will not be able to have a better future for our countries. Thank you, Mazia. Emmanuel, this is so important that we talked about this very international and having these different aspects, putting mm -hmm. a headlight really on the conflicts and giving people a voice where they don't can have their voice their selves. Is this kind of an idea also of the History Channel to show Absolutely. history and make it really feelable? Absolutely, and, and we, we always say history is happening now. History is always in the making. Um, mm -hmm. What was the past yesterday is, is history of tomorrow. It's, it is so fascinating, especially with this conflict. We are in the 11th year and the world has forgotten about it. Mm -hmm. And it's the second biggest man-made catastrophe after World War II. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the numbers, it's, it's something unfathomable. And um, we try in a time when people are thinking about other things like the pandemic to take the limelight to those victims, mm -hmm. to the survivors. And um, it's also something which is very dear to me. Uh, I'm a grandchild of, of Holocaust survivors mm -hmm. and seeing people, um, especially from Syria, um, who have been brought up with anti-Semitic anti tropes um, 
fighting this in Europe and showing there's another side, a different side, uh, to, to refugees, to people from Syria who are willing to reconciliate, to build bridges. And this is something which I'm very, very happy and very thankful for all those people on the panel. Um, you're all bridge builders for me. Absolutely. And, and um, together we can try to make the world a little bit better. And, and this, is, this is our role as, as filmmakers or as, as a channel um, to give context to all those big conflicts in the world and try to at least support the understanding. Mm -hmm. And showing history, especially in the present, maybe that is um, helpful to not make um, the same mistakes. Um, of course, history is repeating itself, but it is a little bit of a help. And I have two quotes uh, from the film at the end of our talk. One is, the names of the victims restore a little bit of their dignity the Assad regime tries to take away. And the other quote is, courage was always in the heart of the Syrian people, but hope was missing. And maybe we could give a little bit back of hope also by making this film from Mazia Bahari, the Iranian-Canadian journalist and the director of 82 Names. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Jomana Saif, the human rights attorney, and thank you very much, Dr. Klaus Müller from the European uh, representative of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial. Thank you to the panel, of course. Um, enjoy the Doc Fest. Um, screen other films too. Thank you to Emmanuel Rothstein, our much, longtime Florian. partner from History Channel. And the film is running first on our, on the festival and then also on, on the, the History. Channel channel Absolutely. and um, I wish you all a good time and thanks for talking to us. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Goodbye.